Hello everyone, welcome to Open University again. Uh, today we have uh, Ryan Juni uh, to present his view uh, on how to build uh, community routes, startups, and uh, uh, Ryan has his successful story about creating his own company and selling it to Google. Everybody, I think, dream of it. <laughs> how to build a company and to sell it to Google. And I think uh, today we can uh, have a format not like a lecture, but a discussion, because we have a very practical questions since Kolkov and Open University. Um, we trying to create this environment of uh, startups around Skolkov. And uh, in Russia, there is uh, still no community, but it, it is, but it's very small. And so uh, I hope that Ryan and uh, his talk tell us how to start to build in this community, uh, especially community with young people who only want to start their own companies and what they should do and uh, what Skolkov can do and help them. All right. Um, so that's with you. I, I do have um, a presentation, but I think what I'll do is I'll just talk about the part of the presentation about my background, just so you know who I am and, and what I've done. Um, and then maybe it'd be more interesting to just have a discussion and for you to ask questions. Um, I do have some prepared structure about different things about starting a company, but it's more advice on how, how to think of an idea, how to execute your company, which you probably can read a lot about. I've been giving this presentation at a lot of different places, so it's um, it's fairly broad and, and general. Um, so, so I think it'll be better in this case just to have a discussion. So I will talk to you about my background. I grew up in Sydney, Australia. I was born there. Um, in 2003, I moved over to Stanford University, um, and I've been living in Silicon Valley in California ever since. I studied uh, electrical engineering at Stanford, my master's degree. After I finished at Stanford, I went and, and joined a startup that some friends of mine founded. It was called Sensory Networks. Um, we built hardware technology for the network security industry. That company raised $20 million and operated for four or five years um, before sort of tanking. And it, it didn't work out, basically. The company doesn't exist anymore, but um, I definitely learned a lot from that experience um, about what things went well, what things didn't. Uh, after I left Sensory, well, after the company finished, I started my first company, which was Omnisio. Started that in 2007. We built a web platform for editing online video. Uh, we were funded by Y Combinator, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. It's an incubator in Silicon Valley, run by Paul Graham, that guy on the left. And we were one of the earlier companies to go through Y Combinator back in 2008. We um, we worked in our company for about nine months um, during YC and, and then beyond and uh, pretty quickly were approached by Google and ended up selling to them. And so as a result of that, I became a product manager at YouTube. I worked at YouTube for a little over a year working on um, all our consumer face facing features like the video editor, the video player and um, all the stuff you see on the site basically. So I stayed there for about a year, but realized big companies is not really my favorite thing. So I left to start another company. I met my now co-founder, Max Kabinsky, who's actually Russian, but he lives in Silicon Valley. He's been living there for a long time. I don't know, maybe some of you know him. Um, he's, he's founded companies in the past as well. And so we had both founded and sold companies. We were looking for our next idea. We started brainstorming together. And then in 2011, we decided to start my current company, which is called Emporia. And we build um, web and mobile products for shopping, uh, focusing on fashion. So we have a few different products we've built in the e-commerce space, targeting fashion. Uh, we raised 1.3 million about two years ago from some top Silicon Valley investors, um, many big names who you would have heard of. And the path of, of our current company we first launched the Emporia.com product. Um, we spent about six months building that, then launched it and ran it for about six months. This product was built around the idea of, of adding machine learning personalization to your shopping experience. So our, our goal was to learn what your individual tastes were and then go and find products from around the web to show you and that you may be interested in buying. 
Um, after about 12 months though, we decided that it wasn't working as well as we thought it should be. And so we stopped working on it and started a new product. This second product we worked on was called Fashion Blitz. Um, this time it was an online game. Um, it was a game where you could assemble clothes into an outfit. It was meant to be fun and, and addictive. And as a side effect, you could also buy the clothing items that you were playing within the game. We worked on that for about three months before reaching the same conclusion. It's not working as well as we wanted it to. So we stopped working on that and started our third product, which was stylefeed.com. Um, similar space. The idea around style feed was you could subscribe to your favorite brands and receive notifications whenever something went on sale or something arrived new in the store from, from your favorite brands and, and stores. We, we spent two months working on that one. So we were getting faster and faster with our experiments, but came to the same conclusion, it's not working. Um, I'm illustrating this point to just show you pretty clearly that startups are all about experimentation. It's very rare that the first thing you try to work on will be what ends up working, uh, what ends up being successful. It's, um, if, you, if you look at any successful startup and ask their founders about how they started, they probably started doing something quite different to what the product ended up becoming. Still within the same general market and general area, but the product um, morphs quite a lot and it was, in our case, that was the case. Kaleidoscope is the products we're working on now. We've been doing that for about 11 months in total. Um, we're still working on it because it's working a lot better. Uh, this is sort of the chart of, of the number of people that have downloaded it over time. Uh, we launched back in April and it was growing slowly until we ended up getting featured by Apple on the App Store, which gave us a good spike around the end of August, caused it to start growing faster. And then just this week, we were featured by Google, which is the, the next spike and we're hoping to see the growth continue rapidly from there. So we're still working on Kaleidoscope, which is a small team, four people, three of us in Silicon Valley and, and one in New York. Um, we're like the, the tech team in the Valley and she's our fashion person in New York to interface with the industry out there. And um, actually this is out of date where as of this morning up to about 450,000 downloads getting featured on Apple or Google makes a huge difference. And so we're, we're getting into the zone where we feel like this is starting to work but we still need to grow our, our user base much more for this to be a successful business. So we're spending all our, of our time uh, thinking about how to do that. Um, so that's, that's my background. Um, would any of you be interested in, oh, actually, in addition to my startups, I should mention that I also do some mentoring in the Valley and in Australia. 500 Startups is a, another accelerator you've probably heard of. I'm a mentor there and also StartX, which is the Stanford Student um, Accelerator Program. I also mentor there and then these two are in, down in Sydney, Australia. So I spend a lot of time trying to help entrepreneurs in Australia learn about the best practices of Silicon Valley and um, I, I see a lot of parallels in doing that as I do in coming here and trying to spread the Silicon Valley knowledge. Some investing I do on, on the side when I have some time. I'm mostly interested in the biotech space as far as investing goes. These are a couple of my um, investments doing interesting stuff in synthetic biology. So, I mean, I, I can talk about some of these topics, but just let me know, do you, are you interested in hearing general, here's how to start a company, or are you more interested in having a discussion about what, whatever's on your mind? It might be more fun just to answer questions if, if you have them. Any thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'll do is maybe I'll go through this relatively quickly. I won't go into a lot of detail and then based on what captures your attention, you can ask questions. The first section I talk about is your mind of an entrepreneur, what you should be thinking about before starting a company. Um, I think it's the most important part of being a good entrepreneur is managing your own psychology. That's the the biggest strength and weakness that you'll have. The first thing I would point out is that being an entrepreneur is, is a very different career path to any other career that I can think of. Um, I tell people you should really only be an entrepreneur if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't have any choice, if you feel like there's nothing else you could possibly do that would make you happy. If that's the case, maybe you should be an entrepreneur, but if you can imagine any other career that you could do that you would be happy doing, 
go and do that instead because being an entrepreneur is very stressful and difficult and it's you should only do it if you have to. But if you decide that it is what you really want to do, my advice, my best advice is just get started. You'll learn a lot more by starting a company and, and being active rather than you will reading or listening to people like me talk to you about it. Just, just get started, build something, launch it, see what happens. Um, you should be prepared for this emotional roller coaster. Uh, you've probably heard the term and I can tell you about it, but you won't realize how bad this is until you experience it for yourself. But as an entrepreneur, one day you think everything's amazing. This is, I'm on top of the world. I'm going to make a billion dollars and this is perfect. The next day you think, what am I doing? I've just wasted my life. Everything's falling apart. And literally day by day, this you'll have these very wild swings. Every entrepreneur I've spoken to has said, that yes, this is very true. And as much as I tell you about it, you won't feel how painful it is until you do it yourself. But I just want to point out, be prepared for this and learn how to manage your stress so that you can try and stay fairly balanced. On days that things are going well, try not to get too excited and complacent. On days that things are going bad, try not to get too upset. Just keep moving forward and making it happen. And then lastly, Realize that we're all figuring it out as we go. None of us really know what we're doing, even the most successful entrepreneurs. We kind of have a rough idea of maybe what we're trying to do, but really day by day we're just encountering challenges and figuring them out. You don't, don't feel like you have to study and learn a lot and become an expert before you start a company. You don't. You, everyone figures it out as they go along and you should do that as well. So that's just the, the preparation phase, how you, what you need to be feeling and thinking. Coming up with an idea, um, I like this model, which Peter Thiel came up with. He's a, another investor you may have heard of. He was also the founder and CEO of PayPal. Um, a good idea generally is at the intersection of these three things, something that's valuable, something which means there's a very big market potential, a lot of potential customers or users, a lot of potential to make money. It's something that you can have the expertise and ability to do, and it's something that no one else is doing. I, I believe it's much better to start a company that's original and innovative than it is to try and enter an already crowded market. There have been a small number of successes of just copying other existing ideas, but if you really want to build a big, world-changing and uh, valuable company, it's much better to, to be doing something new and original. If, you're, if you have an idea that's kind of at the intersection of these three things, it's a good idea to pursue and you should get started on it now. Um, and I want to emphasize it's important to make sure that the idea you pick is something that you're personally very passionate about. Um, I see a lot of people trying to choose ideas based on what are investors excited about right now, which markets are, are hot. But unless you're personally very passionate in your core about what you're working on, it's going to be hard for you to survive the the up and downs, the emotional roller coaster, and you're going to experience long periods of quite intense pain, to be honest. And unless you have that fundamental passion driving you to keep going, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not, you're probably not going to succeed. So definitely choose something that you're personally passionate about, not. Not something that investors seem to be excited about or your friends seem to be excited about. You personally make sure you feel you're excited about it, about what you want to work on. Um, I made this slide just to illustrate the types of things you'll be thinking about in different industries where you'll be spending most of your mental energy. If you do something in the consumer internet space, you're going to be spending... 90% of your time thinking about distribution, which means how do we get users, how do we get people to find our site or our app and, and download it and start using it. In my case, for my company, that's what we spend almost all of our time thinking about. The, the process of building and designing the software takes a relatively small amount of your brain power. The biggest amount of time you'll be spending is how do we get users. And so if that, that idea of marketing and, and social psychology that's needed to get a lot of users. If that excites you, then maybe you should do an idea in, in the consumer internet space. In, um, in the enterprise software market, you'll be spending 90% of your time thinking about building, managing, 
and um, executing a sales team. So if the idea of selling into big companies and that whole sales process is something that you feel you're good at and, and want to spend your time on, then doing something in the enterprise software space might be a good idea. And there's very clear ways to make money in that industry if you can be good at selling. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, if you look at some of the more uh, emerging markets, say alternative energies or biotech, nanotech, AI, lots of um, hard science-based industries, you'll be spending most of your time trying to solve difficult technical problems where if you manage to solve them, there's, there's already a, a sort of a big market waiting for your product. Um, imagine if you came up with a cure for cancer, it might be very hard technically to come up with that, but if you invent it, then suddenly everyone's going to want what you have. So if you are more technically inclined and like the idea of just solving difficult problems, I would probably recommend looking at some of these other industries and, and not necessarily the software industry. Just because you, in, in the consumer and, and enterprise software industry, you're not often spending your time on the technical problems. Sometimes, yes, but most often, these are the things you're, you're thinking about. Um, my, another piece of advice is be very careful about choosing your co-founders. Um, I like to compare it to getting married. You're going to be spending all your time together. You're going to be having a lot of arguments, going through a lot of stressful situations together, and you need to make sure that your relationship can withstand that sort of stress, which means you should only really start a company with someone you've known for quite a while, quite a long time, and you've already tested your relationship, know that you can work well together, know that you can survive stressful situations. It's a bad idea to start a company with someone you've only just met um, just because the chances of you of your relationship surviving when things go bad and things always go bad, the chances of it surviving are, are slim. Y Combinator has said publicly that the biggest reason they see why startups within Y Combinator fail is arguments between founders which cause the company <clears throat> to break up. So be very careful about choosing your co-founders. <clears throat> Accelerator programs. Um, I think they're a great idea, especially for first-time entrepreneurs. You can learn a lot by going through an accelerator program. <clears throat> You'll get access to great networking opportunities. They often help with fundraising, either directly by giving you money or indirectly by making introductions to investors. And they help with mentoring. And I put this URL here. It's, it's a list of um, many different accelerator programs around the world, just so you can get a sense of what other programs are doing in, in various countries and what they offer and, and how successful they are. Obviously still number one is Y Combinator by far and you can learn a lot just by reading about what YC has done. So, so that's um, a little bit about just coming up with your idea and getting your first steps. Once you've decided on what you want to work on, um, executing the company, my first and most important piece of advice is, is focus is incredibly important. I'd say the biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs, first-time entrepreneurs especially, making is they try to do too much um, in the beginning before actually launching and getting customer feedback. Um, this is particularly true for engineers and technical people whose inclination is to sit in the office and design and build products because that's what they love doing and that's what they're good at compared to the idea of going out, talking to customers and trying to sell your product, seems scary because what if they don't like it? What if they don't buy it? So it's more comfortable just to sit there building and making it better and better and better before launching. And that's always a bad idea because you might be building completely the wrong product and you'll never know until you start talking to customers. So it's always best to pick the smallest, most minimal possible thing you can build and launch that and see what customers say and use that feedback to change direction if necessary. In the example I showed at the beginning of, of my company, we kind of made the mistake with our first product of spending too long building it, and then our second and third and fourth products were a lot faster because we learned from that mistake. <clears throat> I'll skip that slide. This is um, a model called the Lean Startup, which many of you will probably have heard of. It's created by Eric Ries. It's It's been very popular in Silicon Valley over the last year or two. And it's pretty much considered today to be the best 
framework to think about running your company. And the idea is you're going to be iterating around this loop many times when you're running your company. And your goal, your objective is to go around that loop as quickly as possible. <clears throat> the loop being you come up with an idea, you build that idea which becomes a product which you launch to the market. You measure the results of people using or buying that product which gives you some data which you then use to learn and modify your idea because your idea is never going to be right, you're always going to be adjusting it. And you want to get around this loop as quickly as possible, which means don't spend too long building your first product. Don't spend too long measuring it. Just pick the most important things to measure that you care most about and learn as quickly as you can from that and then cycle around again. So if you can go around this loop very fast, you're much more likely to succeed than you are if, if you kind of spend too long in any one of these phases. I'd say the most important part is the measurement aspect. Um, getting feedback on what's working and what's not. So this is another model which is popular. Um, Dave McClure came up with this one, 500 Startups founder. He calls it Startup Metrics for Pirates because the acronym R sounds like a pirate. Um, acquisition. So th this basically shows the types of things you should be measuring and what's important. Um, the first category, acquisition, talks about how do people find your product. Um, this this most directly applies to consumer internet products, so I'll, I'll use that as an example, but how do people find your website or how do people find and download your mobile app? Um, track a lot of data as you, ca as you can to see where they come from, how do they find out about you. The next category is ac activation, which means people who arrive at your site, do they become activated, do they start using it, or do they just arrive and then immediately leave? So you're tracking how many, which um, how big of a percentage of your users become activated. Retention is the next category. Do the users who come, do they return again a day or a week or a month later, or do they just come once and never return? So tracking the percentage of people that actually come back a second or third time is important. Revenue, um, all, now that you have users coming back and you understand how that's working, are you able to make money from those users? Obviously, this is a business that we're trying to build and at some point we have to make money. So measuring that. And then lastly, referral. Do each of the users that you have invite their friends? Does each user you have cause more users to come to your site? If that is true, um, your site's going to grow. So tracking the percentage of people that invite, tracking the percentage of invites that are accepted, those sort of things are important. And this is displayed as a funnel where at each step, uh, you're going to lose some users. So for example, say 100 people arrive at your site, maybe only 80 of those people end up using the site and become activated. Maybe only 50 of those people ever return a second time. And some of those you'll make money from, some of them will refer their friends. So you're losing people at each stage of this funnel and your goal is to minimize that percentage of people that drop off at each funnel. And that's, that's what that whole experimentation and optimization loop is, to try tweaking and changing things to try and um, increase the number of people that make it all the way through the funnel. This is an example. Um, it doesn't look like you can see that chart. But um, this is from my current product, Kaleidoscope. <clears throat> we like to think of startups as being in one of two, two phases in the early days, before product market fit and after product market fit. The concept of product market fit basically just means that the product you've built is resonating with the market that you're targeting. People seem to like it. People seem to be using it. Um, if, if, if that seems to be happening, then we say you've reached product market fit. If, you, if it hasn't happened yet, you're in the before product market fit stage. And when you're in that stage, I'd say the most important thing for you to be measuring is retention and engagement. Do people who use your products come back and use it again? When they are using it, are they using it for a long time? Are they doing a lot of actions on there? Um, this is how you can tell if, if you're getting close to product market fit or not. If your users never come back, it means you haven't built a product that they like. So you have to figure out what to change. If, if you could see this chart, this shows what we track. We track weekly retention, so people who come one week, do they return the following week, and then the following week, and the following week. We see about 42% of our users who come returning one week later. And then 
after two weeks and three weeks, there's a slight drop off down to about 30% of people who are still using the site six weeks later. So we, we feel that's actually quite high, and I, I think it is for a consumer internet business. That sort of level of retention, if you can achieve it, is good. The other products that we built prior to Kaleidoscope didn't have anywhere near as high retention as this, um, which leads us to believe that we're getting much closer to product market fit with this product, and that's why we're still working on it. For a mobile product, you can also look at the App Store ratings. That's a really good way to get feedback from users. We have a, a quite a large percentage of five-star ratings, which tells us that, again, users like what we're doing and we're, we're close to product market fit. Um, in addition to the, the, the quantitative data, it's, much good, it's a much better idea to get qualitative feedback, so descriptive feedback from users. Talk to them as, as often as you can uh, and make it really easy for them to give you feedback. So this is a screenshot from our application. We've translated the application into 30 different languages and we make it very easy by tapping a simple button for users to be able to type in a sentence or two, giving us their thoughts. And as a result of this, our whole team receives about 20 emails every day with feedback from users all around the world telling us what they like, what they don't like, what features they wish we had. Um, and this is, one, this is probably the most valuable way that we learn what we need to change in order to improve our metrics. We can learn what features to build next based on what most people are asking for. <clears throat> um, I, I won't go into detail here, but there's a few other things you can do to get feedback. This, this site in the middle of the slide, usertesting.com, is a really good site to get video feedback from your users. <clears throat> you can post a task saying, I want users to come to my site and do these five steps. You'll pay something like $5 per user, and in return, you'll get a video recording of that user um, clicking around on your site, doing what you ask them to do, and talking out loud as they're doing it, telling you what they're thinking. And just by watching five or 10 of these videos, you will learn a very large amount of data about what's working and what isn't in your product. Um, some things that you thought might have been very obvious um, about, about your user interface, for example, might be totally non-obvious and users might be getting confused and not knowing what to do. So you really should do something like this. Um, even better than recorded videos, if you can invite people into your office and do in-person interviews. Um, in, in the US, we post on Craigslist most often saying we want someone to come into our office for 45 minutes. We'll pay you $20. Um, sit down, use our new product, tell us what you think about it. And if you do that five or ten times, a again, you'll, just, you'll know so much more about your user base. Um, when I worked at YouTube, we were quite sophisticated about doing this. We had a, a special lab set up with a one-way uh, mirror so that the users would be sitting in a room um, working on the product and then I would be behind the mirror with our engineers watching how they're using it. And things that we thought were obvious, that people should be able to figure out and understand, you learn that they just can't understand it and it causes you to redesign a lot of things. So you don't have to be that sophisticated. You can just sit down with your user and talk to them. You don't have to have a whole lab set up, but um, do something like that to learn from your users and, and you'll be much better off. Um, and then after you've reached the stage of product market fit, I'd say the most important metric to start measuring at that point is growth, especially in consumer startups. You live or die based on how fast you're growing. Um, and our growth right now in our chart, uh, it's, it's, it's increasing, but it's not growing as fast as we want it to yet. So today, our number one focus at Kaleidoscope is how do we increase our growth, in particular, our growth in daily active users, the number of people that use our app every day and you want this number to be growing fairly rapidly in order to build a valuable consumer company. <clears throat> so that was just a little bit about how to think about running your startup, treating it as an experiment, treat it as gathering data and, and responding to that, to that data. Pitching your startup is another important thing that you need to know how to do well. You'll be pitching all the time, whether it's to investors, to reporters writing articles, to em potential employees that you're trying to convince to come and join you. So you need to be good at pitching and uh, you need to prepare a few different types of pitches for different situations, ranging from anything 
from a single sentence that you might be able to shout at someone in a crowded room telling them what you're doing to a, a 10 slide deck that you might present to some venture capitalists when you want to raise money. It's very hard to create a, a good short pitch. So a good, um, a good pitch to create is a demo day style presentation, which is what we use at, at Y Combinator, for example, where you get up on stage um, and pitch your company in just two minutes to a room full of investors. It's very hard. You, you can't convey much information in two minutes. It's a very short amount of time. So you have to be very careful about which things you focus on talking about and you have to pick only the most important, exciting things that will cause investors to want to come and talk to you later. So it's very hard to create that. So I always recommend starting building your long pitch and then slowly boiling it down into smaller and smaller increments until you have essentially your elevator pitch. I won't talk in too much detail about what to include, but these are the most important things to include in your pitch. Um, you can read about this online in a lot of detail, but if you're making a, a 10 slide deck, you should have one slide on each of these items. The first slide being a very clear description of what it is you actually do. Um, just very clearly say, we are building a mobile app for fashion. I mean, so something very clear. You don't want, a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake when they're pitching of talking in very vague terms about big, well, here's the problem with the world. And they, they spend too long talking about abstract things before actually saying what it is they do. And if you do that, your audience is going to basically not be listening to anything you have to say because until they understand what you're doing, they don't really know how to interpret everything else that you're saying. So always start out saying what you do. The biggest complaint I hear from investors when they're listening to pitches is like, what, what do they do? I don't know what they do. So very clearly say what you're doing first. Then you can talk about the problem. What's the problem with the world today? What's the pain that people feel that you're solving? Explain what that is and why it's important. Then your solution, what have you built or what are you building that solves that pain, makes it better? And then very quickly get to showing a demo of, of your product or, or service. Um, it's much better to show than it is to tell. So you want to get to that as soon as possible. And after you've gone through these first four points, your audience should have a pretty good understanding about what you're doing and why. And at that point, you can start talking about all the, the business aspects, such as how big is the market. Investors, um, venture capital investors are looking for billion dollar markets growing very rapidly. You want to explain what market you're attacking and, and how big it has how big it could potentially become. Your business model, how do you make money? Um, this is important in varying degrees. If you're doing a consumer internet company, um, generally it's enough just to talk about how you eventually plan on making money, but you might not have any plans right now. If you're doing a, an enterprise software company, you should very clearly say, here's how much we're charging it for, and, and here's, here's why we know companies will pay. You might need a, a much clearer business model there. You definitely don't need cash flow projections and all that kind of stuff, definitely not at the early stage, but you need to be able to explain how you will make money. Distribution is how do we get users or how do we get customers. This is usually the hardest thing to solve for any startup, so spending some time explaining how your plan for attracting users, is it something that's going to grow virally? Do you have to spend a lot of money on advertising to convince these users to come in? Do you have to hire an expensive sales team to phone up companies and ask them to buy? Whatever it is, explain how you're going to get customers. Then um, at the point I've listed here is secret source. If you have something unique to your company that no one else has, that's your secret advantage. If you can talk about that, you'll get your investors or your audience much more excited. This could be anything from um, some new technology you've invented and, and patented maybe that no one else has or your team may have an expert that's the world's best expert in some industry. Um, anything like that that you can talk about. And honestly, a lot of startups, especially in the consumer space, don't really have a good answer to this question. The real advantage that most startups have is speed. Uh, most startups win by moving much faster than big companies and, and, and their competition. So practically, that's your real advantage. But if you also have something you can talk about as a secret ingredient, um, then you should definitely talk about that. 
then talk about your team, who you are, your background, why are you the best team to be doing this startup and not someone else? And end with your milestones. What have you achieved to date and what are you planning on achieving next? So maybe you've built a prototype, maybe you've already launched, maybe you've already got some customers and making money. What are your next steps? Are you raising money? Um, what do you need next? And giving a, the investors or your audience a clear understanding of where you are in the phase of startup startup's life cycle, um, that will help them understand how they can best help you. I'm just giving a little bit of data about fundraising in Silicon Valley today. We think of fundraising at the early stage in two different um, categories. The first round of funding you raise we call the seed financing. That's generally when you're raising around 200000 up to about $2 million today in the Valley. That's usually raised as a convertible note, as a type of um, investing instrument. Um, once you've gone beyond the seed stage and you need to raise more financing, we call that a Series A. That's generally when you're raising more than $2 million. It's generally raised as equity. And this data shows that over the last several years, the, there's been a very rapid growth in the number of companies raising seed financing. Um, but there hasn't been corresponding growth in the number of companies raising Series A financing. So it's, it's very easy today in the Valley. Well, it's, it's not very easy, but it's the easiest that I've ever seen it in, in my nine years of living there to raise a seed stage round today. But it has not become much easier to raise a Series A. So there's a lot of companies who have raised a seed round and have been operating for a year or two <clears throat> and now they can't raise a Series A to continue. So I'd say a lot of investors are quite worried at the moment what's going to happen in 2013. All these companies who can't raise a Series A are going to go out of business and um, it's going to be a very interesting year. Another trend is the ri rapid rise in valuations for seed stage financing. So a few years ago, raising a seed round at a valuation of around $3 million would have been considered good. Today, raising a, a seed round at a valuation of $10 million is, is not unheard of. And as, even f um, especially for Y Combinator companies, raising it at $15 million and above is actually quite common. So the market is very, very hot in Silicon Valley right now. And a lot of investors are quite unhappy about that, obviously, and, and don't think it's going to last too much longer. But no one really knows. Lastly, I'll just spend a very small amount of time talking about exit, <clears throat> and then we can have a question time. Um, I think it's important to think what your goals are as an entrepreneur when starting a company. Do you want to be like this guy on the left? Who's, this is Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox, a good friend of mine, and this is Kevin Systrom, the founder of Instagram. <clears throat> I think a lot of people wish they were Kevin. Um, he started Instagram less than two years ago, sold it to Facebook 18 months after starting for a billion dollars. Personally made probably around $350 million from that deal. It sounds pretty exciting and the, pro the problem is a lot of people try to do that and that only happens once every five or ten years. It's, it's not a very common event. Much, much better is to try and be like Drew who started Dropbox um, a little over five years ago, maybe more than that. And for the first several years of operation, no one really knew much about Dropbox. Maybe you had used the products, but it wasn't very well known how successful they were. They were actually very successful from the beginning. They were making a lot of money, very profitable from day one, but they kind of kept quiet. They didn't tell anyone. Their goal was just to build a successful company that was making a lot of money. To, and now today that they have kind of become relatively well known. Um, people realize how successful they are. They're being valued at around $4 billion by investors. Um, and Drew's just focusing on building a successful, independent, profitable business. He's not trying to build something to sell. He's just trying to build a, a good business. And I think that is generally the right approach. There's a saying that companies are bought and not sold. Um, if you, even if you want to sell your company, it's best for you just to focus on building a successful business because if you do that, companies will approach you and ask to buy you. If you build a company with the goal of selling it and go around asking, do you want to buy my company? Do you want to buy my company? That's never going to work. So 
your goal should always be let's, let's build a valuable business and then if you want to sell, when the offers come, and you'll always get offers if you're successful, you can choose to take it or not. Um, there's a trend in the last year or two in Silicon Valley of many acquisitions happening at a very early stage, which we've termed acqui-hires. It's happening because all these companies that have raised seed stage financing um, are, and are, are unable to raise a Series A financing are kind of sitting around like, what do we do now? In parallel with that, there's a trend, well, the, the demand for engineers far exceeds the supply of engineers. Every company in Silicon Valley is trying to hire engineers right now, every company, and no one can get enough engineers. And so the companies who can afford to do this, like Google and Facebook and Twitter, they simply just buy up all the small companies, bringing them into their company as a means to get engineers. So they'll generally pay around one to two million dollars per engineer. If you're a small team of say three engineers, you might get bought for up three million dollars, even higher, maybe four, five, maybe even six million dollars. In exchange, you'd be expected to work at the acquiring company for generally two to four years. Sometimes your investors would get paid back, sometimes not. Um, but this, this trend has been very big this year. Um, it will probably continue into next year because there's a lot of companies that will be out of options. They'll, they won't be able to raise a Series A. The choice is close the door or sell. Um, the question is, are there going to be enough buyers for all these companies? Um, the answer is probably no. So it's going to be a very interesting year in 2013. So I know that was very fast and overview of a lot of different things. So um, I think at this point, I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Um, let's start here. Um, you said about passion, which uh, every founder uh, should have uh, for the area, for the business he or she found. Now, uh, what, the, what about background? Is it necessary to, to have a background uh, in the industry uh, for founders to develop some business? or Because I know it's uh, it's quite a usual story when when investors it's, it's quite offensive for such kind of cases. Uh, so, um, so do you need to have a background in your industry? It depends on the idea. So, um, like I mentioned when I showed that model of how to choose your idea, you need to make sure it's something that you're capable of doing. Um, whether that means you need to have a background in it or not depends on what it is. If you're um, trying to invent a new type of nanotechnology, but you've never studied nanotechnology, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, but if you're just trying to make a new photo sharing app, or in my case, a video editing site or a, a fashion mobile app, I had never done any video before that. I had never done any fashion business before that. But those are things you don't need experience in. It, you can, it's not that hard to figure it out. So it depends. But um, it's always a, a better story to investors if you can explain that you have this secret expertise and that's why you're going to win, even if that's not even true. I mean, it helps make a good pitch to investors and it'll get them more excited. Um, and of course, don't forget, you don't personally need to have all this expertise if, if you can hire experts. So if you want to start a nanotechnology company and you don't know about it, but you've managed to convince some professor of nanotechnology to quit and join your company, then that's fine too. Uh, I want to ask you about your current project about fashion. I think, uh, uh, first question, how many ideas uh, did you uh, analyze before you find the idea about fashion we, with your partner? So we started out with the idea, not fashion, but we, we were initially focused on the idea of just online commerce in general, we realized that online commerce is, has been growing very fast in the US. It's about 10% of all sales now happen online. Um, but back in 2008 or no, 2009, when we first started thinking about this, we hadn't seen a lot of technical innovation in the commerce space. And so we kind of decided as engineers, let's build some technology that makes online shopping better. And we decided to focus on personalization. So we thought we'll build some machine learning algorithms that will learn what you like 
And so you don't have to go and search 20 different stores. You just go to one site, our site, and you'll see products from everywhere customized just for you. And then with that idea, we thought we'll start with fashion and then we'll do it for other things because fashion is um, it's something that everyone has a lot of different individual tastes and there's a lot of variety of items. And so we thought this was a good problem domain to apply some algorithms to solve. Um, as I said, it, we couldn't get it to work um, for a variety of reasons, mostly because it was too hard to get users to come back to the site often enough. Um, retention was the problem because the site was very focused on transactions like come here, buy something, and you don't want to buy something every day. And so you, you're not coming back to the site very often and, and you'll forget about it. So that our subsequent ideas were more focused on building an engaging product that would cause people to use it regularly and then gradually shift them over to buying stuff. And so because we had already built our first product in the fashion space, we decided to stay in the fashion space and somehow we ended up becoming like a fashion technology company. That was never our original idea, but once we started digging into the industry and becoming somewhat experts on how the industry works, we decided to just try different ideas in that space. Uh, um, I think m maybe uh, uh, you uh, did so many p p p pivots before uh, you uh, don't uh, didn't work in fashion industry before and uh, you didn't have fashion experience yep. and uh, after well, one year you uh, 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 feel into uh, you put here into uh, fashion experience and uh, uh, understanding more also you are uh, trying several me mechanics of maybe first personalization uh, then gamification and uh, maybe uh, if you uh, have more experience in this this me mechanics and uh, fashion expertise, it's, uh, uh, maybe it will uh, uh, not. Um, I think it maybe it will be better. It, it's um, I, I I definitely understand what you're saying, and it's in some cases that's true. In our case, I don't necessarily think that is true just because we're building a consumer product and consumer products, as, as smart as and experienced as you think you are, you're never going to really know what, what's going to work and what's not with, with consumers. It's like a black box. You, you put something out there and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and you really don't know why. Why did Instagram become so popular when there was 20 other photo sharing apps? No one really knows. It's kind of luck, I suppose. And so in our case, in, in the fashion space, yes, we didn't have expertise in the fashion space in the beginning. And there was another factor that I didn't really focus on, but we hired a, um, a girl in New York as our director of business development. We hired her at the same time as we started Kaleidoscope, our most recent product. And she helped with the design of the product, giving um, her input as, as the fashion expert. And so our, our year of learning combined with her industry expertise combined made Kaleidoscope a much better product for the industry. And so there's several factors that I think contributed to why Kaleidoscope is more successful. Um, and so, yeah, if you are entering an industry where you don't have any background or experience, um, it, it might be a good idea to either have employees or advisors who are from the industry that can tell you how that industry works. From the outside, we saw the problems with the fashion industry and thought, we can solve those. They're, they're easy to solve. We know how to build algorithms. But in reality, it's just not how the fashion industry works. It's very um, just based on feelings and aesthetics, and it's very hard to quantify that with algorithms. So. What's what we thought would, was true as engineers was was not true as you know as people in the fashion industry can tell you and so we learned that and um, we, it took us a year to do it maybe if we had hired someone earlier we would have learned faster but it, I, we can't know for sure if that would have been true. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a, a startup. Uh, and uh, mm, a little story b before question, <laughs> okay? Uh, we made two publications uh, about our startup, uh, uh, about our project on internet. 
uh, and uh, each of uh, these publications um, led to about 1,000 or 2,000 registrations on my startup. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of positive feedback, emails, uh, feature requests, and currently uh, uh, we've got uh, two kinds of work which we should uh, do. Uh, from uh, from one side, we've got a lot of feature requests, uh, we should code in, code in, code in, and so on. From the other side, uh, uh, the, the influence of these publications um, uh, is not so much now. It's uh, it's clear, and we, we've got now only some registrations per day, and uh, we've got uh, some kind of promotion. Yes, uh, and uh, but uh, it's it's not our full time job. Only two people work on it. Yes, and. Uh, uh, th this is a problem. What should we do? Coding or promotion? Yes. And uh, my question is, uh, how uh, did you divide your time between these two directions in your startups? Mm -hmm. So, um, press or promotion is, it doesn't often translate directly to a lot of downloads or, or users in our case. It's good for getting awareness of your company. Um, we did a lot of press when we launched Kaleidoscope and it, the biggest benefit we got from that was that everyone in the fashion industry or the fashion designers and fashion brands knew about us. Um, it didn't really translate to us getting many downloads, but it means that when we go to talk to these big companies, they're like, oh, Kaleidoscope, we've heard of you. And it, it gives us credibility. So press is important for credibility with partners, employees, investors, if you, if you go to pitch your company to an investor or to an employee or to a, or someone else and they've heard of you in the press, they, they'll think of you as being much bigger than you actually are. So that's the, really the benefit of press. Um, so what should you do? Well, I wouldn't say you should just spend your time coding because you don't know what to code. You don't know if you're building the right thing. You have to learn what to build. And so that's I know it already. I've got a lot of feedback with uh, users saying me. Yeah, so people have told that, you yeah. things, and to the, I mean, you can't always trust a hundred percent what they tell you. People act differently to how they say they're going to act. People might say, "I would do this," but when it when it comes down to it, they do something different. So it's good that you have that feedback. And my advice would be to. Again, figure out how you can test that as quickly as possible. Remember that cycle, go around that cycle. So instead of building out the complete feature, can you build a small subset of that? Or can you build a button that, set, for example, just say users asked for a feature saying, we want to be able to, in our app, we want to be able to take a photo. One simple way to test that would be to add a button which says take a photo, but it doesn't work yet, and just measure how many people click on it. If no one clicks on it and no one tries to use it, then don't waste the time building it. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's difficult to do that aggressive because if you have a button in your app that doesn't work, that will piss people off. But I'm just trying to illustrate the concept of trying to think outside the box, think how you can test your features in the smallest and fastest way possible before spending a lot of time coding them. And if you have that mentality, then um, I think you'll have a better chance of succeeding. And in your case, if your challenge is how do we grow and get users, you should be focusing on features that are going to cause people to share with their friends or whatever it may be, ways that are going to cause people to more people to use your app if you think that's the most important thing to focus on. And you should, in my opinion, before you have reached product market fit, your most important thing is retention and engagement. So I don't know what your statistics look like about people returning and using your app, but if you dig into those statistics, maybe you'll find that people only use it once and then never come back. If that's the case, that's a much bigger problem to solve. Why are they not coming back? Figure that out and fix that problem first. But um, as I said, I can't tell you the answer without the data. You have to approach, You have to treat this as an experiment, look at the data, decide a hypothesis based on that data, test the hypothesis and see if it worked or not and change as you go. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Good evening, Ryan. 
first of all, thank you for coming to Moscow for your uh, informative and interesting presentation. I have two short questions. Um, it's interesting to hear your point of view. What do you think is the best country to start your business? And the second, uh, how did you protect uh, copyright or your brands or and logos? And is it important for a startup? Um, Thank you. So, firstly, I suppose, what's the best country? Um, it's, it's a big question and, and there's no one answer, but if we want to focus on technology companies, then the best place to start a technology company is Silicon Valley. And it's not about America being the best country, it's about Silicon Valley specifically being the best place. Other places in America are nowhere near as good. New York is maybe number two, but outside of Silicon Valley in New York, it's just as hard to start companies as it is in other countries. So it's not US versus the world, it's Silicon Valley versus the world. Um, and that applies to technology companies. Um, if you're doing a, a company in some other field or if you're building a company that sells to the Russian market, maybe it's better to be based in Russia. I mean, you don't want to be selling to Russia from the US and if you're not also selling to the US market. So there's a lot of it depends, mm -hmm. but generally, because starting a company is so difficult, you want to remove as many um, challenges as possible. And if by being based in Silicon Valley, you remove some of the challenges, then it's going to make you more likely to succeed. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't succeed in another country. There's plenty of successful companies that start in other countries. Um, Atlassian is a big company that some of you may have heard of if you're developers. They make Jira and some other developer tools. Very su successful company. They're based in Sydney in Australia. Um, so they decided not to move. They decided not to leave Australia and they've still become very successful. So it's not impossible. It's just harder to do that. Um, as far as protecting copyrights and trademarks and things like that. Um, it wasn't important for us. We didn't do anything. Um, we don't have any patents. We don't have any trademarks. I think if you're building a consumer internet or a consumer software product, the value of patents is very, very minimal. Your biggest advantage is, is speed and moving quickly. If you think about it, it generally takes, I think, around three years to apply for and receive a patent. In three years, your company has either succeeded or, or died. It's, it's By that point, by the time you get the patent, it's, it's irrelevant. And even if you do get your patent and someone copies you, what are you going to do? Are you going to try and sue them? It's very expensive to sue them. You don't have the money for that. So really relying on patent protection is not a good strategy in that market. If you're doing something in biotech or you know, ph pharmaceuticals and you've invented a new drug that's really valuable, then patenting it, sure, that's a great idea. Um, as far as copyright, well, you don't have to do anything for copyright, at least in the US. You just have copyright on what you produce. Um, trademarks, uh, there's no downside to applying for a trademark on your name and your logo. It just costs a little bit of money to pay the lawyers to do it. But if you think you have a really cool trademark, why not trademark it? That's fine. In our case, we didn't bother. But um, if you, yeah, there's no downside in doing that as long as you have the money. Um, but generally, Generally, I, I believe execution is far more important than trying to protect your IP, executing quickly and launching and learning and as fast as you can rather than writing up you know, patent applications. Thank you. We have only five minutes left, and may I ask you two questions. Uh, first about mentoring. Uh, when it's most uh, mo uh, most useful for startup companies to be mentored by uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs like you. Mm -hmm. uh, is it when, for example, I have only idea and I go to you for uh, advice, or if I already launched, or in which stage? What is the role of? Uh, I think um, the answer is every stage. Um, it's important to have advice from more experienced people at every point. So if you're just at the phase of having an idea. It's a very good idea to go and talk to experts in that industry and ask them, here's my idea, what do you think of it? Um, when you're running your company, it's important to get advice on how best to run it. And I think the best mentors to have are people who are only just a little bit ahead of you, maybe two or five years ahead. If you go and try and get a mentor who's been doing it for 20 years and is like, you know, 
already very successful, it might be hard for them to remember all the way back to when they were a, a small struggling entrepreneur. But if you talk to someone who only did what you're doing, uh, if they only did it two or three years ago, it's still very fresh in their memory. And so for that reason, a lot of people I ask for advice are my friends who are starting companies and running companies that are successful, but they're not, I, I don't go and try and ask Larry Page, how did you start Google? I would go and ask Drew about f information about Dropbox or some of my other friends who are even less successful than Drew, um, but have only been doing it for a few years. And so every stage of the way, look for people who are a little bit ahead and have done what you're trying to do successfully and ask them what they think. Okay, and the second question about uh, building a community. Uh, so what are these uh, intangible aspects of building a community? Is it some virtual place like social network or physical place about events? Should it be professional or just uh, around hobbies uh, for startups and so on? Um, so building a community, the, the biggest value of Silicon Valley, it's just because everyone is already there. And so the value you get is the serendipity that happens just by bumping in to people and randomly meeting people on the street or in coffee shops. You go down into a coffee shop and sit down and everyone else is on their computer coding away and you might overhear some conversation and start talking to a person and that's how a lot of um, connections happen and things get done in Silicon Valley and that's just because everyone is already there. If you're trying to build it from scratch, your goal is just to attract as many high quality people as possible um, and then once you have them there, ha having them interact with each other and so networking events like you mentioned interacting in person I think is always better than virtually uh, the, but you know having virtual groups is also good but if you can I mean Silicon Valley has tons of networking events every night there's probably five events or more that I could go to if I wanted to um, but then I would never get any work done um, and what people do in these events do, do they talk about their professional uh, issues or are they just chatting about uh, something different usually there's a theme so maybe they'll have a guest speaker who will come and give a presentation and then afterwards there'll be a bar and people will stand around drinking and talking sometimes there's no speaker at all it's just a pure networking event come here and meet other people interested in the mobile industry come here and meet other people interested in this industry and just come there and network. Um, there's events focused specifically on helping people find co-founders. We have a, a group called Founder Dating, which invites people who want to start a company but don't have a co-founder to come and meet other potential co-founders. Um, there's all sorts of things based on different topics and what you want to get out of it. Um, I think on the, the virtual side, you can learn a lot about um, best practices of Silicon Valley just by following along some of the important blogs and things. Um, if, if any of you haven't heard of Hacker News, you should definitely read that. It's all, all in English, or mostly all in English, um, but it's news.ycombinator.com and every important thing that's happening in Silicon Valley is, is on that site. And I read that several times a day just to keep track of what's going on. And I can still keep track of what's happening in Silicon Valley without being there. Um, and so you'll know all the stuff that's going on and um, you, know, you can bring the best of that to Skolkovo or elsewhere. Okay, thank you. And my last question. Uh, we are building Skolkovo now from, from zero, just a plain field. And what is your opinion? Uh, what is a uh, uh, physical object that should be in Skolkovo obligatory? A physical object? Yes. What should we build? Um, <laughs> to, to help to develop a community? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's good to look at offices of big successful companies like Facebook and Google and places. Facebook, again, today was voted as the, the best place to work um, and they've been consistently voted as the best place to work. And so if you look at photos of their campus, they always have fun things to do like, you know, you can go on ping pong tables and, you know, whatever it is, like that comfortable bean bag to lie on the floor and f funny things just to play around to distract you from from your work um, I think having a lot of creative spaces just like whiteboards and things that you can just be brainstorming and creative is, is important 
Um, it's a bit of a funny thing that Facebook has, but they have a Lego wall where it's just a wall where people can stick Legos on it and make things. Like these things, I mean, no one object is going to make any big difference, but it's the whole environment you're creating of very relaxed, do whatever you you want to, to to feel comfortable. So it's not a very rigid working environment. It's very relaxing and allows you to be creative and and come up with brilliant ideas. Okay, thank you, Ryan, very much. Hope next time you will go to school call directly yeah. to our first building. I'll definitely come yes. back maybe in summer when it's a bit Thank more you very fun. much. And I thank uh, the Embassy of the United States who helped us to invite you here to make a lecture. Great, thank you. And feel free to email me anytime with questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer emails.